I'm going to very briefly um, introduce our panelists um, in the order in which they will speak uh, so that I don't have to come back up here again until Q&A. Um, Robert Wesley is the Louisiana Outside Council Health and Ethics Professor in Legal Ethics and Professional Responsibility at Tulane, which is a fitting chair for someone who holds, holds a PhD in philosophy. Um, he is, and I'm very jealous of this, Director of Tulane's Paris Summer Program. <laughs> Uh, for the past decade, he's written uh, extensively about reparations for slavery, and he will share some of that work with us today. Noah Zatz is my colleague here at UCLA and a core faculty member in the Critical Race Studies Program. And he's also Associate Director of the Campus-Wide Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. He writes on areas of labor and employment law and anti-discrimination law, and he will share some ideas about this field as they intersect with affirmative action. Russell Robinson is uh, a professor at a unnamed law school in Northern California, uh, but his, his real claim to fame is that for many years he was a member of the UCLA law faculty, a former co-director of the Critical Race Studies program, um, and we expect him to come back in the same way that I did. Um, he has written about race. He has written about race, sexual orientation, and anti-discrimination law in a diverse array of, array of settings, and he'll speak about marriage equality as it intersects with post-racialism. Rose Quisan Villasor is, is at UC Davis School of Law, where she teaches property, critical race theory, and advanced immigration. Um, she currently serves as the <coughs> chairperson of the ALS uh, Minority Law Professors Section and is the past recipient of that section's Derek Bell Award. She's published widely about immigration law, how racial and tribal identities compare and contrast, and she is writing a book about citizenship and nationhood in the U.S. territories. Her remarks today will explore some of these topics as inspired by whiteness as property. Nora Arakat is a, an assistant professor at the New Century College at George Mason University. She was previously a Friedman Fellow at Temple University. Nora writes prolifically in academic and popular venues on on Palestinian nationhood, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and the Middle East more generally. And she also appears on TV um, talking about these subjects. And she will speak on how some of these timely topics um, uh, coincide with uh, her reading of whiteness as property. Please join me in giving your undivided attention to our panelists. And please turn off your cell phones. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very honored to, um, to be here this morning to have an opportunity to talk about how um, influential Cheryl Harris has been on me as a scholar and also uh, personally, um, and in particular her, her article, Whiteness as property has been um, extremely influential uh, <clears throat> in my own work, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. I just wanted to um, <clears throat> hasten to correct one thing in Laura's introduction of me. I am the former director of the Paris program at Tulane. <laughs> well, that makes me feel better. That makes you feel yes. better. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> makes me feel worse. <laughs> Um, but um, <clears throat> a little about <clears throat> my relationship to, to Cheryl. Um, you know, I think uh, <clears throat> one of the pieces that was shared with the CLE folks for this event um, is my piece from uh, the fall 2005 issue of Representations. Um, <clears throat> the accursed share, genealogy, temporality, and the problem of value in black reparations discourse. I actually um, wrote that piece in, uh, <clears throat> at a time when I was uh, a fellow at the Humanities Research Institute in Irvine, and, um, and Cheryl was also a fellow at the same time and um, and really, um, again, just served as a model for um, how to be 
an engaged scholar on these types of issues. I think that um, one of the things that <coughs> that has really uh, struck me is that in order to um, to understand whiteness as property, it seems it was first necessary to revisit American slavery, right? <coughs> So that the object of property is ineluctably sutured to the subject of property in a symbiosis of subordination and domination. And in my own work, I've also had to revisit American um, slavery quite a bit. In fact, some would, some would say that I'm obsessed with it. Um, What is fascinating about the relation is its ability to persist beyond the abolition of the institution that gave it meaning. And um, since I've been at Tulane, I've had the uh, privilege of teaching a seminar in critical race theory in which Cheryl's work has been indispensable. And and I also recently have started teaching a seminar on law and literature. And <clears throat> during um, the last session of Critical Race, I had a student who came up to me and said, have you heard about uh, Carla Holloway's book, Legal Fictions, Constituting Race, Composing Literature? And I said, well, no, I haven't. She said, well, you really should read it. And so I not only read it, I decided after reading it that I would include it in the syllabus for my law and literature course. And as I was reading through it, there's a chapter here on um, property, the claims of property. So in the very first chapter of chapter one, she says, Legal scholar Cheryl Harris has written perhaps the most provocative and critically compelling e essay identifying the inherent property value in whiteness. For Harris, the nomination of whiteness as a tangible thing like property invested with, invests it with an inalienability and control that was fundament fundamentally proprietary. This value came to direct legal resolutions that protected claims made on behalf of white citizens. So um, there it is. I mean, again, even in a law and literature context, um, Cheryl has her influence um, is there, right? <clears throat> she depends on Cheryl's work quite a bit in this chapter. And she's asking similar type questions that I ask. I, she says, the critical questions that shape this text asks why matters about personhood, slavery, and identity would continue to exert such profound narrative energy long past the era of slavery, right? So why is it that <coughs> these questions continue? Her answer to her own question of why is that <coughs> from the era of enslavement through this day, race matters precisely because the law will not release it, all right? Mm. So it's the law that won't release um, <coughs> this, this construct. So what whiteness as property does, <coughs> in my view, is facilitates a, f a fundamental socio-legal uh, reassessment of the socio-legal re relations that are claimed by some to be value neutral as in fact racially biased. <clears throat> it's the difference between viewing current race relations as racially distinct from the past and viewing those same relations as coextensive with and causally linked to past practices. In other words, it's the difference between past as bygone and the past as prologue. Clearly, I fall on the side of the past as prologue. And in <coughs> the black <coughs> problem of value in black reparations discourse piece, um, what I attempt to do in thinking about 
the whole topic of reparations is um, is to consider what are the legal roadblocks to black reparations. And the roadblocks are relatively uh, <clears throat> clear, right? There's a statute of limitations problem. There's a standing problem. <clears throat> um, if <clears throat> the object of a potential lawsuit or the government, there would be a sovereign immunity problem. Mm -hmm. All kinds of problems there. And in my most recent work on this issue, what I do is I say, OK, let's go back to this foundational moment of slavery and see whether those who were actually enslaved would be able to seek and obtain restitution. So in restitution claims for wrongful enslavement and the doctrine of the master's good faith, I look at that exact question where there's no problem with statute of limitations, there's no problem with, um, <clears throat> with standing, there's no problem of uh, that no procedural problem other than the plaintiffs themselves are enslaved persons claiming that they're wrongfully enslaved. And this is what part of what I say in that article. The political interdependence of white democratic institutions and black slavery has been well established in historical literature on the subject, as has the reliance of modern capitalism on slavery. Americans frequently take pride in the United States as the wealthiest nation on earth, yet whites hardly ever acknowledge the contribution of black slavery both to the creation of that wealth and to the opportunities that flow from it. The purpose of this section is to show that the, ordinar the ordinariness of the legal double standard between blacks and whites and antebellum, antebellum property claims. The, this double standard sets the stage for diminished expectations with respect to property claims by blacks, such that the most that blacks could typically hope for was their freedom from bondage, but rarely, if ever, compensation for their exploitation or abuse by whites. By contrast, since whites enjoyed a presumption of freedom, their expectations of compensation in property disputes, even if sometimes disappointed, were routinely validated as a central focus of their legal claims. <clears throat> and I can't believe I'm, is it? Is that the right time? Correct time? Wow. So I, <clears throat> so I talk about the case of James versus Carper and I use it as exemplary of this Dumble standard. In that case, a white woman, Mrs. James, brought suit for compensation on a claim of trespass against an innkeeper to whom she had rented her slave Bill. She sued to be personally compensated for the entries inflicted on Bill when the innkeeper caused Bill to be severely whipped in the belief that Bill had stolen money from one of the innkeeper's guests. At trial, at the trial, at trial, the jury was instructed that the employer of an enslaved person had the same right as the owner to inflict punishment on the slave. The only limit on such punishment under Tennessee law at the time was to refrain from taking life or limb or the infliction of great or unnecessary torture. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court of Tennessee found that the transfer of the right to punish a slave from the owner to a temporary employer could not arise by legal implication in a case that involved allegations of criminal wrongdoing on the part of the slave, as opposed to insubordination toward a superior or wanton misconduct that was not criminal in nature. Such a rule would interfere with the court's own authority to punish the slave. Thus, the court granted Mrs. James, the slave owner, a new trial and a fresh opportunity to prove her damages before a jury, which could include, according to the court, payment of exemplary damages by the defendant to the slave owner. 